The Dharma Bum's Guide to Western Literature is a sort of guided tour of some very familiar books, but looking at them in a very unfamiliar way. Whether it's Ahab chasing the white whale, or Macbeth pursuing the crown, or the two tramps waiting for Gado, or the children in the Virginia Woolf novel yearning to sail to the lighthouse, or Frederick Douglass in his slave narrative yearning to escape to the north for freedom, or William Blake's sunflower yearning for that sweet golden climb where the traveler's journey is done. Or whether it's us, we're all yearning for that same thing, that thing that we know intuitively must be there somewhere, must be available somehow, that final okayness, just that final ah, also known as nirvana. And that's the subtitle of my book, Finding Nirvana in the Classics. Now, the first three words of my title, The Dharma Bums, I borrow that from Jack Kerouac. Thank you very much, Jack. The word Dharma means the path to nirvana, the path to awakening. And my approach is borrowed largely from Emily Dickinson. She wrote, Not knowing when the dawn will come, I open every door. Right? We don't know when the light the insight, the transcendence, when it's going to come flooding in. We don't know what direction or what source it's going to come from. So be open to everything. So that's what's wound up in my books, finding nirvana, not just in this classic literature, but also finding it in movies, finding it in pop songs, and sort of weaving it all together. One of my favorite moments in the book, I had great fun discovering this, was the parallel between a key illustration in The Cat in the Hat and Caravaggio's painting of The Calling of St. Matthew. So this whole thing becomes sort of like a jolly Easter egg hunt. Only when you find these Easter eggs, congratulations, you're waking up to nirvana. The way the book came about was that two things going on in my life. One is that all my life, practically, I've been on the Dharma path. I've been a teacher. I've spent lots and lots of time with lamas and rishis and yogis. And also, for 33 years, I was an English teacher at a private school in New Jersey, a very ritzy private school. So you teach Macbeth for 30 years, you teach Huckleberry Finn for 30 years, and you start to get some feeling for Oh, this is where the bodies are buried. And the bodies that I kept finding kept being this Dharma stuff. J.D. Salinger, the one book of his that everyone reads, or at least used to read in high school, is The Catcher in the Rye, Holden Caulfield, the adolescent, angst-ridden hero. He's flunked out of boarding school. He goes and he kicks around Manhattan for three days trying to work up the courage to go face his parents. And he's completely in this sort of no man's land. He's stuck in this place where everything is kind of depressing and, and just kind of nowhere. And that's us pre-Nirvana with perhaps a little bit of poetic exaggeration. So as he knocks around the city, Holden starts asking people that he meets just at random, where do the ducks go when the lagoon in Central Park freezes over? And no one has an answer for him. And of course, what he's really doing, this is his koan, this is his life question. What he's really asking is, where can I go? Where is that nirvana where I can find relief from my pain, relief from my anxiety and depression? Finally, he asks this cab driver, this very angry, hypertense character named Horowitz. He's a very unlikely guru. And at first, Horowitz just shouts at him, how the hell should I know a stupid thing like that about the ducks? But then he changes the subject to fish. And he says, 
The fish don't go no place. They stay right where they are, the fish, right in the goddamn lake. They get frozen in one position for the whole winter. Their bodies take in nutrition and all, right through the goddamn seaweed and crap that's in the ice. Now, that's very bad science, but it's very good dharma. This is how we find nirvana, not by pursuing some distant Shangri-La where we escape from our everyday life, right in the middle, right in the middle of the crap, so-called, of our life. We meet the challenges, open to them, while opening to the light, opening to the dawn, as Emily Dickinson says, and that's how we make it work. Oh, so many of these people I'd like to hang out with. Shakespeare, of course. Toni Morrison was supposed to be great fun to hang out with. I'd love to take a walk through London with Virginia Woolf. Whitman. But if I had to choose one, Henry David Thoreau. He was America's first Dharma bum. When the sacred books of the East were first made available in English, in the 1840s and thereabouts, there were just a few people in North America reading them, most of them in the neighborhood of Concord, Massachusetts. But even of those few people, Thoreau was the one who said, I want to not just read about this, I want to try to do it. I want to try to live it. I want to do the experiment. So his famous project of building his little shack by the shores of Walden Pond, that's what that was about. He was trying to be a sadhu. He was trying to be like the holy man of India, to minimize his possessions, minimize his responsibilities, and just wake up in the morning and commune, yes, commune with nature, but also commune with the bigger thing, the bigger silence that's behind nature with the infinite. What I hope you'll get from the Dharma Bums Guide is really a new way of seeing, of seeing nirvana everywhere. Not just everywhere in literature, although that's a very good place to start, but everywhere in everything. So if you play the saxophone, if you run a business, if you raise children, whatever you do, nirvana is there. I promise you, the infinite is everywhere. It's got to be, otherwise it wouldn't be the infinite. So whatever you do, there is a way to do it so that it becomes a Dharma gate, a way of opening to the infinite. And also, I hope you'll have fun. I had so much fun writing this book. This ain't school. None of this is going to be on the exam. If it's not fun... What's the point? <laughs>